So we're going to revisit the component balance, something that we've seen a few times now. So what we're talking about here is that we've got a component, J, some, some sort of uh, identifiable molecule or chemical. Could be polymer, could be salt, could be carbon dioxide, could be something else. So that's the component J, and the component J has a concentration, a mass per unit volume, right? So like a pounds per barrel or pounds per cubic foot, something like that, or a gram per cubic centimeter. So that's a concentration. V is the porosity, obviously. And what we have is that the component J can occur in two different places. Uh, it can occur in the fluids, so it can be in the aqueous phase or lake phase or gaseous phase or, or all three, but it can also be adsorbed onto the rock surface. And that's what the CJS is. That's the concentration component J adsorbed on S, the solid. And the porosity is phi, and so then the rock, the rock volume is gonna be one minus phi. So this is the accumulation of mass that occurs. And then on the right is we have the transport mechanism. So how does that component J move through our porous medium? And we said it can move two ways. It can move through advection, meaning the fluid just carries it with it. And then can also move by dispersion or mixing. And the dispersion coefficient is actually a function of the velocity. The higher velocity, the higher the dispersion coefficient. We've seen that in the past, but this term is fixed law, right? And then I sum it up over potentially three phases. L is equal to one to three. Those phases being the aqueous, oleic, and gaseous phase. We won't usually deal with three phases for now. We'll deal with two phases at most, the aqueous and the oleic phase. Sometimes we'll just deal with one phase. So this is the most general form. Well, and I say that, but this is even in one dimension. So if I wanted to make it even more general, I would do the Y and Z component as well. But, but one dimension, I think, is tough enough for us right now. And in a lot of lab experiments, we do things in 1D, so it's applicable. Um, so one uh, simplification here would be instead of having three phases, we had two phases. So the oleic and aqueous phases. And another is that we have no dispersion. No, we never truly have no dispersion. We never truly have no mixing. But there are lots of applications where dispersion is small. In fact, most reservoir applications, advection dominates over dispersion. So this equation reduces to this. So what I have is my CJ is CJW, the concentration of J in the aqueous phase times the saturation of the aqueous phase plus the concentration of the of J in the oleic phase times the saturation of the oleic phase, and then we have the CJS term. And you'll notice I pulled out a porosity. That meant that um, this one goes away, but then I got to divide by porosity there. So this left-hand side equation becomes this. The right-hand side, I'm only summing up two phases. My velocity U is constant, but you know these were supposed to be phase velocities, and we know that U of a phase is the total velocity times the fractional flow. And the fractional flow of oil and water might be functions of space, of, of x. Okay, so this is just a simpler form of this equation. Now, in a, um, we can write this in dimensionless form, meaning that we put it in dimensionless time and dimensionless distance this way. And so I can rewrite this equation as this. Um, notice I've written that in terms of TD and XD. And I've also got some new variables in here. I've got CJ, CJS prime, which is going to be different from CJS, and I've got this new F. So what are those? Well, CJ, we've seen this before, so it's not really new, is the concentration of component J in the pore volume. And so that includes the concentration of J in the aqueous phase and the concentration of J in the oleic phase. So it's the sum of those two. CJS prime, um, that's going to be directly related to CJS. And what I'm going to do is multiply by 1 minus the porosity divided by porosity. The main reason I do that is that now it has the same units as CJ. Okay, Because CJS was per bulk volume, but now it's going to be per pore volume, 
which is the same units of Cj, which is mass per pore volume. And then finally, I'm going to introduce this F, which is the concentration of the fluid that's being advected, that's being moved with the velocity. And it's going to be the uh, summation of this oleic and aqueous phases. So it's going to be CJO times FO plus CJW times FW. So it's this equation just written in a little bit different way. And, um, and it's got the dimensionless time and dimensionless distance. Okay, so, so there, here's our equation. And this is a general equation for two-phase flow without dispersion and solid potentially adsorbing onto the rock surface. Okay, we can do a few things with that. So, so the left-hand equation is um, what I had written before. I can just multiply this through, so I didn't really do anything over there. So now I got a partial of CJ with respect to TD, partial of CJS prime with respect to TD, plus the partial of X, FJ with respect to, to XD. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the chain rule. So remember what the chain rule is of differentiation. It's like dy dt is equal to dy dx dx dt. And we're going to do that so that the variable that we're trying to solve for is the concentration of j, cj, in the numer you know, so in all cases. So what I've done here is this partial of cjs prime with respect to td, I took the partial of cjs prime with respect to cj times the partial of cj with respect to td, and now I've got this partial of fj with respect to cj times the partial of cj with respect to xd. So what's good about that is that now my I've got this derivative, this derivative, and this derivative are all with respect to cj. If I were able to come up with a way to solve that equation, I would get cj as a function of distance and time. If I group like terms, then I can write it this way. So you can see that this has a, a, a 1 in front of it, and this has this in front of it, and they're both multiplied by partial of cj with respect to td, and then you can write it like that. If I divide through by this term here, then what you get is this equation. So you get partial of Cj with respect to Td plus this coefficient times the partial of Cj with respect to Xd. Very similar to equations we've seen in the past, um, especially for the Buckley-Leverett theory for multi-phase flow. And what we learned before is we have an equation like this, sort of a 1D advection equation. You have this coefficient is the velocity of, co of constant, in this case, concentration. Okay, so um, if you wanted to pick, pre predict a, a, pick a certain concentration, then this would tell you what the velocity is as a function of that concentration. So, and, and as I pointed out just a minute, a minute ago, it looks a lot like the frontal advance or what we call the Buckley-Levitt equation for two-phase flow. And you remember this FW prime was the velocity of constant saturation. This is the velocity of constant concentration. Okay, so this is somewhat general. Um, it doesn't include dispersion, but it does include multi-phase flow and it does include solid absorption. Let's look at one very specific case, and that is where we only have one single phase but we have a component on there that might be adsorbing onto the rock. So if you think about uh, polymers, so polymers are normally powders, right? You, you, when you order them, they come into a powder, but when you mix them with water, it thickens the water, right? And so I, uh, I make the analogy that, that polymer fluids are kind of like hair gel. They're these thick fluids and they're used to enhance solar recovery. So the polymer, has a certain concentration in that phase, and it flows with the water, but it can adsorb onto the rock surface. Okay, so it might not all stay in the water, some of it might kind of deposit onto the rock surface. And so we're interested in that because polymers are a common enhanced oil recovery fluid. So we only have one phase, the aqueous phase, that means that FW is one and FO is zero. And that makes my FJ, which was CJOFO plus CJWFW, well, that's simple because um, 
FO is zero, FW is one, so FJ is really just equal to CJ. If you take the derivative, then you get one. So that really simplifies this equation over here because now this numerator is just one. So what that means is that the velocity of a specific concentration is given as one over one plus CJS prime divided, the partial of CJS prime with respect to CJ. Um, let me say a, a couple of things about this. In the absence of any adsorption onto the polymer, this term is zero, right? This partial of CJS prime with respect to CJ. If CJS is zero, if nothing deposits, then, then that term is zero. That means the velocity, this dimensionless velocity, is one. Now what does that mean? All that really means is, is that the polymer goes at the same velocity as the fluid that's carrying it. That sort of makes sense, right? If, if you've got the polymer in there and it's flowing along, it just carries with it and it goes the same velocity, one foot per day or something. If some polymer is depositing onto the rock surface, then, it, then that same concentration, you know, it takes time to build up. So it actually lags behind. And that's why this term over here is going to be a positive number. And one divided by a number greater than one is, is less than one. So the velocity is less than that. So the velocity of an adsorbing component is slower than the velocity of a non-absorbing component or slower than the, the fluid itself. Um, and, and just to kind of give you a, a picture of what this looks like, um, this picture over here kind of indicates the adsorbed polymer. So what happens is that you inject this, this uh, polymer in water solution and you'd really love for it to just go through and not have any adsorption. What happens is some of that kind of builds up this deposited filter cake, this adsorbed layer. It leaves some of that concentration behind. And what's bad about it is it reduces the permeability because you can see that the pore throats are smaller. And if you try to inject polymer into a low permeability medium, then it's not going to flow at all. It's going to get stuck, right? And um, that's a big problem for us because there's lots of applications where we'd love to use polymer and uh, the permeability is just too low. So what does that mean? That means a lot of the research that I do, some of your other professors do, is focused on trying to develop new polymers and with new properties that transport better through these rocks. Uh, we can relate the concentration adsorbed onto the surface it can either be CJS or CGS prime. They're related, obviously, by the, the, the porosity. And what we have here is this expression over here. And I think that a curve like this, if you think about it, makes some common sense. The larger the concentration of the component in the fluid, the more of it that would adsorb onto the rock surface. I mean, obviously, if the concentration is zero, then no polymer is going to absorb onto the surface. So this goes through the origin. This is zero, zero. But as I increase CJ, CJS increases. And so you see this increase. But you also kind of see it, you know, reach this asymptote, or at least it, it sort of tapers off. And um, that sort of makes sense, too, is that you continue to build up the concentration. You know, maybe it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not like you know, you, you double the concentration, necessarily double of it will deposit. This is what's called an adsorption isotherm. And there's a very common one that's called a Langmuir isotherm, which has a very specific equation. And, and um, I didn't list the equation here, but the, qualitatively the picture looks like this. And the idea is that you might have an initial concentration of polymer in your reservoir of zero. I mean, obviously the, you know, Polymer is something we inject. It's not something that's going to be there. But then we inject a certain concentration like this. And from this curve, we can figure out what CJS is, how much concentration has adsorbed onto the rock surface. Now, the derivative of this curve is the partial of CJS with respect to CJ. 
And so you could take the derivative of this curve um, at any given point. So at a certain concentration like this one, you could take the derivative, the slope of the line tangent to that curve would be the partial of Cj as prime divided by Cj. And that would give us an indication or, or would tell us what the velocity of that constant concentration is. So we got this Langmuir isotherm and um, we can use it to determine our uh, constant um, concentration. Um, and really what happens here is, is that if we're injecting our component or polymer or any other adsorbing component from say an injector well to a producer well, or just in one dimension, what will happen is, is that um, you'll develop the shock front, okay, and it's moving with some velocity of constant concentration. And the velocity of that shock front, um, you know, we wrote it as a derivative, you can use it as a, um, as a discrete delta Cjs prime over delta Cj, and um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to show you by hand in a minute how I, I get this, but um, we can write this as 1 plus 1 over d, so where d is obviously this term or this term or, or this term. d is what we call a retardation factor. It is a factor, it's dimensionless, that tells us how much we are slowed, the, the constant concentration is slowed down by the presence of um, by the adsorption. If there's no adsorption, then D is zero, and, and there is no retardation. But if D is greater than one, then this slows it, it down. And um, one other thing, and, and we recall this from our Buckley-Leverett frontal advance equation, is that the breakthrough time is one over that velocity. It's a reciprocal of that velocity of the shock. So, if the velocity of the shock is 1 over 1 plus d, then the breakthrough time, the dimensionless breakthrough time, is 1 plus d. So let's think about this. We're talking about a case where we have no dispersion. So it's this nice moving wall that we have for concentration. In the absence of dispersion and no adsorbing polymer, it takes exactly one pore volume for the component to go from the injector well to the producer well, okay, or from our inlet to our outlet, because it's just moving along with the velocity. So it's um, one pore volume. However, if you have an adsorbing polymer, then it slows it down. The, the, the dimensionless time is one plus d. So it's going to take maybe 1.1 or 1.2 or 1.5 or more pore volumes in order for that concentration to reach the producer well. So remember one thing we could do is we can inject polymer at the injector and we can produce fluid at the producer and early on we won't have any polymer because there was no polymer in the reservoir. It's going to take time to get there. And uh, we can calculate, you know, based on the velocity and the porosity and, and stuff like that, the volume of the reservoir, we can determine how long it should take. We, and and that, that dimensional time is based on the dimension less time. Dimension less time is one pore volume. If it takes longer than one pore volume, then that could mean one of two things. One, dispersion was very large. Here we believe dispersion to be negligible. Or if the breakthrough time is longer, then there was some adsorption onto the rock surface, and this could give us an indication of what that, um, of what that is. Um, so, in um, this equation, I've defined these over here, and again, I'm gonna show it to you by, by hand in just a moment. Um, but, but here's kind of a nice plot of the concentration of our component at the producer well versus time. And you can see what would happen for a non-absorbing chemical is it comes out right around one pore volume. You have a, you're, you're never going to have zero dispersion, so maybe you have a little bit early breakthrough, 
and it does and it does that. Um, and, and I, by the way, I think I maybe misspoke a second ago. Is that this adsorption causes late breakthrough? Dispersion causes early breakthrough. Um, so, if we're looking at this, and after one pore volume, no polymers come out, then that means it's adsorbing. And you can see most of it comes out right at 1.25 pore volumes in this particular case, which means that D is, is 0.25, right? So D is 1 fourth, and, um, and we could use that to calculate the mass of polymer adsorbed under the solid. Okay, so what we were looking at is, what I said is the velocity of the shock is equal to one over one plus the change in concentration of J in the solid phase divided by the concentration of J. And I said that that's equal to 1 over 1 plus 1 minus V by the rho of the solid times the W of the solid of the solid times V over the concentration of the solid. And that's equal to 1 over 1 plus D. Okay. So rho S is going to be the solid density. Typical solid density might be 2.6 grams per cubic centimeters, but the point is, is that's a mass of rock divided by a volume of rock. Ws is a mass fraction. It's going to be the mass of J, the mass of J adsorbed, per mass of rock, right? So it's going to be like pounds of J absorbed per pound of rock or grams of J absorbed per gram of rock. Phi is going to be the pore volume divided by the bulk volume. And then CS is going to be a fluid concentration, which is going to be a mass per pore volume. So this term should be dimensionless. And so what I get is um, rho s is going to be mass of rock by volume of rock. This is rho s. And then w s is going to be mass of j adsorbed divided by the mass of rock. That cancels with that. This is W S. One over phi divided by phi is going to be a pore volume divided by a rock volume. Because phi is pore volume divided by bulk volume, and one minus phi is the rock volume divided by the bulk volume. So phi divided by, so one minus phi divided by phi is, oh, wait, maybe I, yeah, that's, I mixed them up. So that's rock volume divided by pore volume. And this was, again, one minus phi divided by phi. So then rock volume cancels with rock volume. And then this is mass of J divided by pore volume, and all that was going to be divided by CS, which is mass of J divided by pore volume. So this is CS. Okay, and so then this cancels with that, 
This cancels with that, and what I'm left with is a dimensionless term. So one of the things I could do, if I go back to my slides here, is I can use this equation. Let's say I determine, oh, you have a test. Uh, what we can do is from my, my data, from the field, I can determine when my breakthrough occurs. And from the breakthrough, to see how much of a delay it is, that tells me what D is. D must be equal to all of this. If I know my porosity and my concentration of J in the fluid that, I'm, that I've injected, and I know my density of the solid, which I probably do, then I can calculate WS, which is the mass of polymer that's been absorbed onto the per mass of rock. And, and, and you can estimate what the total mass of rock is as well from the bulk volume and the porosity. So what that can really tell you is that how much polymer in pounds has absorbed onto the rock. And so that tells you kind of um, a little bit about how much of a problem that's going to be for transport, which is, oh, let me go here. I'm going to tell you this, it's going to tell you how much the things have changed because how much mass was done on there, but it also tells you how much money you've lost because polymer is not cheap. And any polymer that you, you inject, if it adsorbs, then it's left behind and, and then you can't reuse it. So um, that's a couple things you could do. So basically, in, in summary, what I was trying to say is, is that from the data, you can determine D, and then knowing that D is equal to this, you can determine omega S which is the absorbed concentration per rock mass. And if you know your rock mass, you can calculate the mass of the polymer that is adsorbed and left behind in the porous medium. So I am going to finish with one last example. And this is good because we're going to do an example problem on Friday, which will be the same or similar to an old exam problem. And um, so this is another special case. This time there's going to be no adsorption. Okay, we're going to have a tracer that does not adsorb onto the rock surface. Okay, but two phases, water and oil. So what we have is we've got our reservoir that looks like this. We've got an injector here, we've got a producer here, and initially you're going to have, um, well, maybe this is after some time, after you've water flooded for some time, so now you've got SOR, the residual oil behind, and then you've got SW, which is 1 minus SOR, right? So what we've done is we've water flooded this reservoir for a long time. Uh, you're probably not producing any more oil, but you have oil present, and it's the residual capillary trapped oil. And then the remaining fluid is, is water. And one of the things we'd like to know is, what is SOR? Okay. Why is that important? Well, that tells me how much oil is left behind, right? And it tells me as a reservoir engineer uh, whether or not I think it's a good idea to do an enhanced oil recovery scheme to recover that. If SOR is 10%, you know, maybe, you know, an SO, and the residual oil is always hard to get out, then, you know, maybe you're just done with it. But if it comes back and it's 40%, then maybe you say, well, hey, let's, let's use some sort of enhanced oil recovery method to recover that residual oil. But first, before we do something expensive like that, Let's try to estimate what the SOR is. You can do that a few different ways. Um, one way to do it is that you take a, um, a core sample. So, you, you know, in one of the wells you drilled, you grab some rock and you bring it up, and then you measure it in the lab. Well, that's fine, but that just tells you what SOR is right around the well, and it might not be reflective of what it is in the middle of the reservoir. There are, I believe, some well logging techniques that can do that too, but, but here's another way to do it. And one thing that we do is as petroleum engineers is that we try to find the answer in multiple ways and compare the answers because we're making 
you know, sometimes not just million dollar decisions, but hundreds of million dollar decisions on some of these things. So we want to check and double check and triple check our work. So you can use a tracer test to determine what SOR is. Okay. And what you do is you have two tracers, two different tracers. One of them is miscible in water and oil. Okay, so there are, there are some, some chemicals that are you know, that are, are, you know, alcohols and things like that that um, dissolve in water and dissolve in oil. Okay, and so that would be a tracer that is miscible in both, but in different fractions. And what we'll often do is we'll, we'll call K1 is the ratio of the concentration of tracer number one in the oleic phase divided by the concentration of one in the aqueous phase. So if K1 was equal to 1 exactly, that means that it was equally miscible in water and oil, but that's generally not the case, right? You can measure this in the lab. It's super easy to do, right? You can do this by yourself. You get a, a cup and fill it with water and fill it with oil, and, and then you put in your component, and then you measure the concentration in the water phase, you measure the concentration in the oil oleic phase, and you get K1. Okay, so you can calculate K1 and now we know what it is. On an exam or a homework, I would probably give you K1. Number two is miscible only in water. Okay, so we have a second tracer, but it only goes in the water, doesn't go in the oil. Okay. And what I can do is I can write my mass balances. And I write, I've got two components, so now I've got to write two equations. So the first one is the partial with respect to TD, and that's going to be of C of component one in the aqueous phase times saturation of the aqueous phase plus C1O times SO, but C1O is K1 times C1W. So I can write K1 C1W times SO. And then I write this as partial respect to XD of C1W FW plus C2 of C1O FO is equal to zero. Okay, so this just comes from the equation we derived on the PowerPoint notes a few minutes ago. Uh, we can simplify this. Oil is only residual oil, so that means FO is zero. This term goes away, that's zero, and then this is equal to one, right? The fractional flow of water is one. Only water is flowing, the oil is trapped. That makes this equation simpler. Tracer number two, it's only miscible in water, so we can write partial TD times C2WSW. Okay, we know that C2O is zero, plus partial with respect to XD, partial of C2W. Oh, um, oh, let me um, see. Sorry, this is partial respect to XD of C2W FW is equal to zero, and we know that FW is equal to one. Sorry about this, was just a mistake. So, if I do the simplifications I had up there, which are that FW is equal to 1, FO is equal to 0, SO is equal to SOR, and I pull things out, I can rewrite these equations as SW plus KSO times the partial C1W respect to TD 
plus the partial of C1W with respect to XD is equal to zero. This is for my first tracer. And then SW, the second equation, times the partial of C2W with respect to TD. The reason I can pull the SW, the SO, and the K out of the derivative is because they're constants. The water saturation and the oil saturation never change. Oil is a residual. Water is um, one minus the residual oil saturation. Those are constants, so I can pull them out. I don't know what they are, but I know that they're constant. So this is tracer number two. So we've got these two equations, and if, well, if we wanted to, we could just divide through over here, and then what you would get is that the velocity of one is gonna be one over this coefficient. So it's one over SW plus K SO, and the velocity two equal to one over SW, right? It's one over this coefficient. Or what you could say is that the breakthrough time is equal to this denominator. So SW, which is one minus SOR, plus K times SOR, or K1, I guess I was calling it before. That's the breakthrough time of component one, and then TD breakthrough of two is gonna be one minus SOR. Okay. I calculate that based on what I've known about the velocity of these concentration fronts, which is this coefficient over here is one over, it, it's one over this coefficient of the velocity, or if I were divided through, it would be equal to the coefficient in front of this term. And when I do that, I get these two equations for breakthrough time. So, what do I do? What do I do in the field? I inject this tracer. I, well, I inject two tracers. I inject tracer number one, which is miscible with both, and, and, and uh, tracer number two, which is only miscible in water. And I weight at the producer well, or my operators weight at the producer well, and they measure the concentration of those tracers as they come out. And for the longest time, nothing comes out. Tracer one doesn't come out, tracer number two doesn't come out. And after a while, tracer two shows up. And that's the breakthrough time of tracer number two. And that's equal to one minus SOR. And then, a little bit later, tracer number one comes out, and that's the breakthrough time of tracer number one, and it's equal to one minus SOR plus K1 SOR, and I know K1. Um, it seems like I've got two equations and only one unknown, SOR, but I have another unknown, maybe, which is the porosity of the rock. That might be something else I don't know, and we know that the breakthrough time is related to the porosity as well as the real time. And, of course, in the field, we're going to measure the real time, and so what you have is you got two equations and two unknowns. From those, you can calculate SOR and you can calculate your porosity. So have a wonderful rest of the day.